might take your Bible this evening, if you would please, to the book of Acts, chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. We finished up our study of Esther last week and I want to bring you a study tonight about another one who made a difference. And that is a man named Barnabas. Barnabas. Wonderful, wonderful man. We first meet him here in Acts chapter 4, beginning in verse number 36. And Joseph, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas, which is being interpreted the son of consolation, a Levite, and of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it, and brought the money, and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now, Father, add your blessing to the reading of our scripture here this evening, and as we open up your word and study it together tonight, I pray you'll open our understanding, help us to glean some Uh, truths here and some wonderful lessons from the life of Barnabas that will make us better Christians for you, that will allow us to make a difference in the world in which you've given to us and in the lives of people who are near and dear to us. And so bless our study of your word tonight, open our understanding as only you can, and I'll thank you for it. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Who is Barnabas? Well, We learn from this passage here, his name was Joseph, or Joseph, and uh, that was his given name. We know he was a Levite, that means it's a priestly tribe, and uh, he was nicknamed, surname in the Bible is a nickname, Uh, like you give people nicknames, and so they nicknamed him Son of Consolation. Consolation is the same word as we use for encouragement. So it's not like we, we talk about consoling somebody. It's like, oh, that's okay. You're all right, you know. Uh, but that's not what Barnabas did. He was an encouragement. He was the son of encouragement, if you will. Uh, he, they, they believe, it's not recorded in the Bible. His conversion is just here. He's in the early church. They believe he was saved at Pentecost. They believe he was one of the 3,000 that were saved and baptized on the day of Pentecost. Traveled there from Cyprus and became a believer there in the church. In fact, so much so, you're going to find out he had land back in Cyprus and he sold it. And uh, he's going to give that money from the land to the church. Now, Cyprus uh, was the home of Venus, which was the goddess of fertility. It's the center of pagan worship uh, on Cyprus. Uh, Cyprus was a very immoral place to live, uh, much like Corinth would have been. And so a very wicked place that he was from. And so here he is, a Levite from a, from a pagan, uh, heathen land called Cyprus. And yet uh, he became a follower of Jesus Christ. Uh, and, a, and a tremendous follower of Jesus Christ. You know, nobody is outside the reach of Jesus Christ. And uh, never, never, don't, don't ever decide ahead of time that some person can't be saved. Because God can save anybody. And he certainly did a a wonderful thing when he saved uh, Barnabas. And Barnabas received Christ as his Savior. We're going to look, what can we learn from Barnabas' life? You know, we we meet up with him several times through the book of Acts. and, And Barnabas always made a difference. He always made a difference. The first place you see him making a difference is here in the church in Jerusalem. And he made a difference by being a sacrificial giver. He really impacted the church. He was the first one to sell property and sell possessions and then hand the money over to the apostles to distribute to help other people who needed it. And he set the example and he inspired others. Uh, to do the same thing. Not, nobody was under obligation. Nobody was required to do anything like this. He just did it sacrificially. He learned, he learned early on that having possessions here on earth isn't the goal. He learned early on that the one who dies with the most toys doesn't win. Okay? He knew that. And so he caught hold of that real quick. He understood that heaven is the ultimate prize. And that's what he's living for. And, you know, it, learn this lesson. It's impossible to be used in extraordinary ways by God without being a person of sacrifice. You have to be willing 
to sacrifice. If you're self-seeking or full of selfish ambition, then you're not going to be used by God in an extraordinary way. You'll limit yourself. Because right after, right after this, right after the last two verses of chapter 3, uh, or chapter 4, come chapter 5. In chapter 5, we met another couple. Ananias and Sapphira. Well, they got, they got the idea of selling some land and giving the money. Where did they get that from? Well, they got that from Barnabas. And they said, well, if he did it, we can do it. Everybody thought, Barnabas, hey, they, look what Barnabas did. They said, hey, we want that recognition too. Let's, let's do that. Only they were full of selfish ambition. They were full of pride. And they lied about what they did. They said they were giving it all and they didn't give it all. See? They, they had that self-seekingness about them and that self-centeredness. And, and uh, something, listen, something extraordinary happened to them, not through them. Huh. And we've learned some things from, about their giving as we looked at their story. But listen, uh, I'm, I'm saying sacrificially. If you're not sacrificial in your spirit, and willing to give sacrificially, then God will not do extraordinary things through you. You can't serve God and serve self. There's, there, you have to serve one or the other. So you ask yourself this question, are you a person of sacrifice? Do you encourage others by your giving? Are you somewhat Selfish or non-sacrificial when it comes to giving? And only one way to overcome that. You know how it is? Give. And, and you realize God gives great grace and joy to those who sacrificially give. Now, the thing is, you don't get the joy and, and the, the, the peace and the happiness first. You get that after you give. You have to give first. And be sacrificial in your giving. You know, it's, it's recorded. Hold your finger there. We'll come back again in Acts. But look in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Would you turn over there, please? Would you turn this up a notch for me, please? This isn't doing anything. I need a little more air, please. Thank you. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Here, Paul is writing to the church of Corinth and giving him an example about giving and he's talking about the churches of Macedonia and do you remember the chief city of Macedonia what it was anybody chief city of Macedonia Macedonian vision come over and help us and they went over and there was no man there there just some women down by the river washing some stuff and Lydia ended up getting saved nobody remembers that huh Philippi Philippi chief city of Macedonia there you go. Y'all flunked the quiz. I just wanted you to know. All right? And uh, so here we are. The churches of Macedonia. Now listen, verse 2. How that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded under the riches of their liberality. How does deep poverty and riches of liberality go together? That's an amazing statement. But he says, to their power, I bear record, yea, beyond their power, they were willing of themselves. Praying with us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering of the saints. And this they did, not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. He's talking how much they, how well they gave. And then he goes on in chapter 9. Notice with me verse number 6. He said, but this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. He which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man according as he purposes in his heart, let him give, not grudgingly of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able, here we go, to make all grace abound towards you, that ye, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. God is basically saying, you give and... I'll take care of you. I'll see to it. Your needs are met. He gives incredible grace and joy when you'll sacrificially give. And I think Barnabas saw, uh, saw some of that in his own life and as he gave sacrificially. Uh, he didn't know. Barnabas, when he did this, he didn't know 
this was going to be written in the Bible and we'd be talking about him 2,000 years later. He had no idea. He's just doing it following the Spirit of God. And we'll say more about that in just a little bit. So, are you a giver? But wait a minute. Are you a sacrificial giver? Don't, I don't want to say sacrificial giving isn't giving till it hurts. Because some people have too, way too high of a pain level. They hurt way too easy. Okay? That's not, that's not sacrificial giving. You know, God, remember the widow woman who God said gave the most? It's because she put two mites in the offering plate. But God is not just looking at what we put in. He's looking at what's left over after we put it in. And that's, the, that's the way you know whether you're sacrificial and you're giving or not. But sacrifice, when you, when you sacrifice, we're not always just talking about money. That's generally where it goes. But listen, you can sacrifice your time to serve others too. You know, you know what I found out about helping others? It's never convenient. Never. When you have all the time in the world and you're just out driving, you're going somewhere, running the store to get something, and you got time, if somebody needs help, you won't see anybody needs help. When you need to have help is when you're running late, you're five minutes behind for an appointment, you're going down the road, and then there's somebody who needs help. That's always the way it is. You have to be willing to sacrifice to help somebody else. So he made a difference in the early church by his sacrificial giving. You know, you can inspire others just by your giving. One of the things as a young Christian, even though I was brought up in a Christian home, one of the things that really inspired me to give was hearing testimonies of people who gave and how God blessed them. And, you know, I was just, I'm a teenager and I got my first job and I'm making money for the first time in my life. And, you know, I remember hearing those testimonies and I remember thinking to myself, I want to get in on that. I want to see if God will do that for me. And, and I'm not a teenager anymore. I know that's a shock. And, uh, but though, though just a few years passed since then. And, but I'm telling you what, listen, God, God takes care of us when we give. God takes care of us when we give. So make a difference by giving. Now, the next time we see Barnabas or hear about Barnabas is over in Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9. Acts 9, as you know, is Saul's conversion on the road to Damascus. Here's the guy who's persecuting Christians and arresting them, putting them in jail. And he's on the road to Damascus and a light shines from heaven above the light of the sun, knocks him off the animal he's riding on, and he hears the voice from heaven saying, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And Saul, says, Saul doesn't know who it is or what's going on. He says, who art thou, Lord? And, and that first time when he says, who art thou, Lord, that's just like, who are you, sir? He has no idea who he's talking to. And then the voice from heaven answers, and what does the voice from heaven say? I am... Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It's hard for you to kick against the pricks. And now he knows he's talking to Jesus Christ. He's talking to the one who, he's, who he doesn't believe in. Who's been arresting all the, the, the believers in Jesus of any that were of that way following him. And he's arresting them and putting them in prison. Now the one who they say they believe in that he doesn't believe in is talking to them. Boy, that was a shock. But you know what the great thing was? Once he knew it was Jesus, then Saul says, Lord. That Jewish man just called Jesus Christ Lord. And when he, a Jewish man calls Jesus Christ Lord, he just accepted him as his Messiah. Lord, what will thou have me to do? And that's Saul's conversion on the road to Damascus. He tells about it a couple other times in the book of Acts when he's before rulers giving his testimony. And he talks about how he got saved. Well, he's saved and God tells him to go into the house of Ananias and Ananias receives him and after uh, he's blinded from the experience and so the scales fall off about three days later. He's baptized and he begins to preach. In verse number 20, straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. But all that heard him were amazed, saying, and said, Is not this... He that destroyed them which called on the name in Jerusalem and come hither for that intent that he might bring them bound unto the chief priest. But Saul increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews which dwelt at Damascus, proving that this is very Christ. 
And after that many days were fulfilled, the Jews took counsel to kill him. But their lying in wait was known of Saul, and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. And the disciples took him by night and led him down by the wall in a basket when Saul was come to Jerusalem. He essayed to join himself to the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, being believed not that he was a disciple. But who? But who? Oh, Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way and how he had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. So he made a difference here in Saul's life by accepting Saul after his conversion, even when the apostles didn't want to. They didn't want to join him. Here's the beginning of what's going to be a long friendship between Barnabas and Saul, later to be called Paul. The Jews had taken counsel to kill him, and they get, get Paul out of Dodge, so to speak, and he gets to Jerusalem. I'm sure he wants to see Peter. He wants to see the apostles. He wants to see the guys who were with Jesus for three years. And, and with him going out and coming in and uh, join himself to them. But huh, they, they weren't going to have anything to do with it. They did not believe he was genuine. They just couldn't believe that Saul really got saved. That surely he's putting it on. He's just going to infiltrate us and then kill us all. That's, just, uh, that, that's what I think they were thinking. And so Barnabas puts his... First, Barnabas puts his reputation on the line for Saul. Barnabas, remember what he is? The son of encouragement. And he's proving it now with, the, with, the, with Saul, who's going to be Paul. He found a friend in Ananias back in Damascus. He's going to find a friend in Jerusalem named Barnabas. It's interesting here when it says in verse 26... When Saul was come to Jerusalem, he essayed. He essayed to join himself to the disciples. The word essayed means to try repeatedly. He tried repeatedly to join himself to the disciples, and they wouldn't have anything to do with him. He didn't just, didn't just ask one time or try one time. He tried repeatedly. But the more he tried, the more they refused. They just weren't going to welcome him. How would you like, how would you like to join that church? Yeah, I went there and they didn't want me. Huh? I went there and they, they said, no, thank you. You're not, you're, we don't want you to come here. And that's how they were treating Saul. Now the amazing thing is, here's Barnabas. The amazing thing is, he believed Saul. In his spirit, he knew this guy's genuine. In fact, look what he tells him. Barnabas took him, verse 27, Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. Hey, you're coming with me. Come on, we're coming in to see Peter himself. Okay? That's in, the, in between the lines there. You don't see that. Barnabas took him, brought him to the apostles, and here's what he declared. He declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way, and how he had spoken to him, and had preached boldly in Damascus in the name of Jesus. Now, look at me. How did Barnabas know that? He only knew it because Saul told him. And guess what? He believed him. His spirit bore witness with Paul's spirit. That what he was saying was the truth. That he truly was a changed man. And that the, the, the Christ that he persecuted is now the Christ he serves. And he preaches. And he's telling others, about Christ. You know, he could have doubted Saul too. He could, have, he could have went along with everybody else. But that's not what a friend does. A friend will stand up for his friend. You can tell a true friend by how they stand up for you in front of those who oppose you. That's a true friend. And Barnabas stood up for what he knew the Spirit of God had told him in his heart. 
and not what everybody else was thinking or doing. Do you have that kind of conviction? That when you know God wants you to do something and you know that God has convinced you of something, that you'll stand for it even when other people around you aren't standing for it? Even when other people around you are not going that way? Will you obey the Spirit of God? There are some that just go along to get along and it doesn't matter who they hurt when they do it. But there's others who just stand by their friends. And Barnabas was that kind of a guy. You learn something about Barnabas about friendship. Being true friends with somebody. Barnabas valued friendship, but you know what? He valued what the Spirit of God was saying to him more than he valued what other people thought of him. He put his reputation on the line. Listen to the Spirit of God. Are you ready to follow the crowd? Or are you ready to follow the Spirit's leading in your life? And, and it's easy to answer that in church. The test comes when you're in the crowd. You know, it was easy for Peter when he was around all the apostles to say, hey, all these guys will forsake you, but not me, buddy. But boy, when he was in the other crowd warming his hands at their fire, it was so easy for him to say, I don't know who you're talking about. I don't know the blankety blank. And he went with the crowd instead of going with what he knew was right to do. So he put his reputation on the line for Saul. The second thing I see here is he, we see the evidence of his actions convincing the apostles. So he tells them the speech in verse 27. He said, listen guys, the Lord has spoken to him and he's preached boldly in Damascus in the name of Jesus. Did he convince them? Well, what's verse 28 say? And he was with them coming in and going out at Jerusalem. And he spake boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the Grecians, but they went about to slay him. So he was with them coming in and going out of Jerusalem. Well, it's evidence Barnabas' words convinced them that Saul was okay. <laughs> that he must be legit. And so he moves in and out with them, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus. And so... He spent some time there talking to the apostles and spending time there with the brethren in Jerusalem. Saul wasn't just sitting around fellowshipping, he continued to preach. And he even, you know, anytime Paul preached, it seemed like there was all the, somebody said there's always a revival or there was a riot. You know, they, they, they seemed like they wanted to get saved or they wanted to kill him. And, and it was no different here from the very beginning. And so he disputed against the Grecians, and now they want to slay him. So, he's got to move again. But I want, to, I want you to notice something also. Number three, I think the next asterisk on your paper there is how the friendship of Saul and Barnabas impacted the rest of the brethren. Because then you see verse 30. When they went about to slay him, which when the brethren knew, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him forth to Tarsus. So now, the brethren know about it. And they're going to send them on. It had a positive effect on everybody. Because one guy embraced him. One guy said, I believe you. One guy. You know how many people... You know, I, I remember years ago, Brother Farley, Dr. Heil said, he didn't believe one teenager would ever go bad if they just believed one person believed in him, cared about him. A lot of times when teenagers go bad, they think nobody cares. Or nobody really believes in me. Nobody really cares about me. You know, there's all kinds of people where one, listen, just somebody to give them an encouraging word, just somebody to say, I'm with you, I believe you, I'm for you, can make the difference. And it sure made the difference here for Saul and with Barnabas. And it affected everybody else. He put his... Uh, neck on, Saul put his neck on the line and preaching in public, even though knowing that they were out to kill him and they were going to take, take his head off if they could. They knew how bold he was for Christ. 
And they knew now that he was on their side. And what happened? Verse 31. Then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria and were edified and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost were multiplied. Oh, the church, the church had rest and a sense of peace. And, and because of that, the, the, the church was strengthened and they were multiplied. Believers were saved and brought into the church and the church was built up. It was edified. That happens because Barnabas said, he's all right. He's okay. He made a difference in Saul's life. Well, let's see the third time he's mentioned. Look at Acts chapter 11. Acts chapter 11. Look at verse 19 with me. Now they which were scattered upon the persecution that arose about Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to none but unto the Jews only. And some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which, when they were come to Antioch, spake unto the Grecians, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. Tidings of these things came unto the ears of the church which is in Jerusalem. All right, hold on, stop there. Okay? Persecution has come. They've, they've, they've gone out preaching the gospel. And they go down to Antioch, and a great number of people have been saved. They're preaching Jesus Christ because He is the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father but by Him. The only way you go to heaven is through Jesus. And so they're, they're preaching Him, and people believe. They believe and ask Christ to be their Savior. A great number of them. And word travels all the way back to Jerusalem. Man, something's going on in Antioch, 300 miles away. And they decide, well now what do we do? Who could we send up there to encourage those new believers? Who do you think they think about? Barnabas. Let's send the encourager. He's available. Let's send Barnabas up there to encourage him. And that's exactly what they do. And so they... They, they send Barnabas, and the tidings come. They, they, Barnabas should go as far as Antioch. Verse 23, When he came, he saw the grace of God, and was glad, and exhorted them all, that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. For he was a good man, and full of the Holy Ghost and of faith, and much people was added unto the Lord. He was rejoicing at these new believers. And he was exhorting, encouraging all of them to cleave to the Lord and stay close to Him. And he's rejoicing in what the Lord had done and the new believers in the faith. He hadn't made any contribution to this yet. He didn't have anything to do with it. He just came down and was thrilled that God had saved these people from their sin. And he rejoiced in the fruit of whoever it was. You know who the Bible doesn't say who went down there and witnessed these people? The Bible doesn't say. I wonder, Barnabas gets the, gets the ink here in the Bible. Who were those people who scattered down there and preached and got all these people saved? The Bible doesn't even mention their names. You know, the great thing about it is it doesn't, it doesn't matter who gets the credit. What matters is people got saved and were following Jesus Christ. See, it's... It, it, it's not he that watereth, or he that soweth, or he that watereth, but God that gives increase. It's all for God's glory, not for our glory. And so, he wasn't worried about who got the credit or who received the credit. He was just happy God was working. And that's what we do. Rejoice in the success of God doing the work. And don't worry about, well, well you know, he mentioned those people, but I was there too. He didn't mention me. Well, the pastor said those people helped, but I, he, didn't, he didn't say I helped and I was there. Hmm? Don't bow your head. It's not time to pray. Let's look at the identification of Barnabas here. Look at what it says in verse 24. He was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost and of faith. And much people was added to the Lord. There's his identification. A good man... And that's, that's, what, that's what other people's opinion of him was. He was a good man, well respected, and, and had a lot of character. But there's more, there's more to a man than abilities. 
and talents. Character is important. I'd rather have character than talent. You know, most, most of the... That's why Michael Jordan was a lousy basketball coach. He never, you know why? Because it, it was too natural for him. He was a natural talent. Most of your natural talented baseball players weren't good baseball coaches. The ones who made good coaches were the ones who had to learn the mechanics and had to learn how to do things the right way so then they could teach the fundamentals to the other, to the players. When everything just comes natural to you, how do you teach somebody how to do that? You don't. It's just talent. See, character is what's important. If, you're, if you have the character that you, that you need, you'll, you'll require and you'll get the talent you need to have. Notice his description. He was a good man, but then they noticed full of the Holy Ghost and of faith. Full of the Holy Ghost and faith. That's what, again, this is God's description of Barnabas. He walked closer to God and he was filled with the Holy Spirit. He was motivated by faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God so he lived by faith we walk by faith not by sight he was filled with the Holy Spirit he was led by the Spirit not by pride and arrogance and the result the result of what happened much people was added unto the Lord do you understand that's by the way that's always the result when you are filled with the Spirit and you're living by faith, people will come to know Christ as their Savior. That's the mark. Barnabas impacted the lives of many people here in Antioch. Never mentions that he was a great speaker. Doesn't mention he was a great preacher or a great orator of any kind or an effective administrator or anything. He only mentions the fullness of the Holy Spirit and faith. And that impacted others for Christ. Be available for God to use. You know, most of the people through my life, my Christian life, being saved since I was a boy, most of the people that have impacted my life, particularly growing up, were not preachers or even great teachers. Just faithful people. Faithfully served the Lord. Some were Sunday school teachers but I couldn't tell you one lesson they taught. I remember their life. I remember the love. I remember the care they had for me. That impacted my life. That's what people remember. And that's what Barnabas made an impact in Antioch. Then notice the cooperation of Barnabas. Notice what happened in verse 25. He had then departed Barnabas to Tarsus to seek Saul. They had sent Saul away to Tarsus, remember? When he found him, he brought him to Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people, and the disciples were called Christians first. Where? In Antioch. So now he goes to seek Paul. Listen, a lot of people had gotten saved. Barnabas goes down there, full of faith, full of the Holy Ghost. Much people are now saved. Things have just mushroomed and exploded. And Barnabas realizes, I need help. He could have said, look what I've done. Look at this great church that I'm building. He said, man, I've got to have help. I'm going to go get Saul. And when he got Saul, he brings him back. And, and he realizes, I have to have some cooperation here. I have to be willing to realize I have to work with others. I need Saul to help me in this work. There's, there's no place for lone rangers in the work of God. We need one another. There's a great work to do. We cannot accomplish it alone. 5,000 some died of overdoses in Ohio last year. 
I, I wish I could say, or you could reach them all, but we won't. We need all the faith-based recovery programs we can get. One of the people asked me today in the thing, and we opened having other faiths come in. I think, listen, we're we're not just a faith-based recovery program, are you? Faith-based, Christ-centered, Bible-based is what we are. We're going to point them to the Bible. We're going to point them to Jesus Christ. Now, listen, if the if the Muslim faith has a recovery program, then let them have a recovery program. I don't know if they do or not. I've not heard of one. Maybe they do. Maybe these other faiths have them, but I'm not aware of them. But we know what Jesus Christ can do. The testimonies that they heard today in the little four-minute video from the rally back in September was over and over and over again of people who said the difference is Jesus Christ. That's what works, is faith in Him. And here He is and. Realizing Barnabas says, I can't possibly do this alone. I'm going to get somebody to help me here. I need Paul to come help me. Placing, placing the needs of these people above his own ego and his own, uh, own prestige and bring Saul in to minister to them. And a whole year they assemble there and labors alongside Paul doing the work that God had called them to do. And they're called Christians first in Antioch. That's what it's all about anyway. Church isn't about getting recognition. Church isn't about being somebody. Church is serving Jesus Christ. Getting people to Jesus. Seeing them receive Christ as their Savior. Watching them grow in the Lord. Watching watching a couple like John and Carol grow over eight years. Stubborn habits, addictions, gone. Gone. Both of them were smokers. I about got cancer just visiting their house. Used to laugh, come out of there, man, smell my coat. Woo, man. It was, it was something else. You know what? Those, are, those, those went away. They just, God God did it. God took it. God took it away from them. That's what it's all about. Last place we look at, we'll go home. Go to Acts 13. The last, last person Barnabas made an impact on, all right? That he made a difference in somebody's life. This is good. I don't care if you think it's good, I think it's good. Acts 13, verse 5. Here's the missionary journey. We were here on Sunday. They're sending out, now Antioch is sending out Barnabas and Saul for the first missionary, first missionary journey. And verse 4 says, They being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed unto Seleucia, and from thence they sailed to Cyprus. And when they were at Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. And they also had John to their minister. Now that is a guy named John Mark. He is a nephew of Barnabas. Okay? You go down to verse number 13. When Paul and his companions loosed from Paphos, they came to Perga in Pamphylia. And John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. John quit. They weren't done. They barely got started on the first leg, so to speak, of the missionary trip. Now, John was probably a young man in his teenage years during this time, John Mark, but he just left them, went back home. Doesn't say why, doesn't say what happened. The Bible is silent on that. They, they just, he just quits. Well, they finish the journey, and they come back, and they report to the churches, and they're home for a while. And now look at Acts 15 with me, will you please? Look at Acts 15 and verse 36. Acts 15 and verse number 36. Notice the Bible says, And some days after, Paul said to Barnabas, Let us go again and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they do. Well, that sounds like a good idea. Barnabas says, Let's do it. 
I'll get John Mark and we'll go. And Paul says, whoa, 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 whoa. Verse 37, Barnabas determined to take with them John, whose surname was Mark. But Paul thought it not good to take him with him, who departed from them from Pamphylia and went not with them to the work. And the contention was so sharp between them that they departed asunder one from another. So Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus. Remember, where was he from? Cyprus. Paul chose Silas and departed, being recommended by the brethren under the grace of God. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, confirming the churches. The two great missionary companions have split up. They'd, they'd been on a great missionary journey. And John Mark left them on that journey. And as they get ready to go on the second trip, Barnabas is very determined that John Mark's going to get another shot at this. And Paul is equally determined that he is not going to. The disagreement was pretty spectacular. The Bible simply says it was sharp between them. You ever hear somebody say the tension was so thick you could cut it with a knife? It was sharp between them. And they split. Barnabas took Mark and went back to Cyprus and Paul took Silas and they went out through Syria and Cilicia. And here's, here's what I learned from this is Barnabas, he makes a difference in the life of John Mark. You know what he was saying? That it may cost us something, but we have to be willing to give people room to make mistakes. We have to give them a chance to make good on their previous mistakes. When other people say, that kid's no good, or that guy's no good, or yeah, I remember he did this, or I remember she did that. Somebody has to be willing to say, I think we ought to give him another chance. I think we ought to give him another shot. I think Barnabas is saying everybody needs room to make a mistake. I think Barnabas is saying, you know what? I think anybody can be brought back from failure. This wasn't a small thing he did. This was big. I don't know what kind of an impact it had on John Mark. But when he realized he gave up traveling with the Apostle Paul because of me, that had to impact his life. That had to speak volumes to him. The encouragement and the investment that he gave into the life of John Mark paid off. Because John Mark ended up being a valuable helper to the Apostle Paul. Now, understand something. How, how, what, remember, it was sharp between Barnabas and, and Paul. Enough that he said, if he doesn't go, I don't go. Uh, then you're not going. That's fine. I don't want to go. I don't know how the conversation went, but I can imagine. It was sharp. It was rough. And the, what, the tell me, tell me the natural thing as you're on that boat sailing back to Cyprus, you'd have had roast Paul all the way back to Cyprus, wouldn't you? I mean, you'd have carved him up and, and eaten him up and spit him out about how rotten he is and how poor his attitude is and how come he doesn't want to give somebody another chance. Who does he think he is? He thinks he never did anything wrong. He thinks he's just perfect. I don't know what he's thinking about. But you know, evidently Barnabas did none of that. None of that. Look at a couple of scriptures with me, will you please? Go to your right in your Bible to Colossians chapter 4. And then pick up 2 Timothy chapter 4. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, then Colossians 4. And then look with me at 2 Timothy chapter 4. 
All right, Colossians 4, verse number 10. Paul is listing here his faithful workers that have helped him. He talks about Tychicus, he talks about Onesimus, he's talking about Aristarchus. Verse 10, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner saluteth you, and Marcus, sister's son to Barnabas, touching whom ye receive commandments, if he come unto you, what? Receive him. Oh, quite a different tune now than what he had back in Acts 15. Now he's saying, receive him. And in fact, I've sent out some commandments about him. And make sure you receive him. Now look at 2 Timothy chapter 4. How many of you know what happens in 2 Timothy chapter 4? Paul's last chapter before he gets his head cut off. Okay? When he says that I'm ready, I'm, I've fought a good fight, I'm ready to be offered, time my departure today, and I've fought a good fight, finished my course, and kept the faith. When you look at 2 Timothy chapter 4, he says in verse 11, Only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with thee. For he is... He is what? Profitable to me for the ministry. Wow! A guy he didn't even want earlier. Now bring him. He's not just... Somebody, a, a nice guy to have around, a good guy. No, he's profitable to me for the ministry. That, that never would have happened if Barnabas hadn't invested in John Mark. That never would have happened if he would have bad-mouthed Paul all the way. But he didn't do that. He invested in John Mark and he became profitable to him for the ministry. But he didn't just do that. What's the, what's the second book of the New Testament? The Gospel of Mark. God even had him write a book of the Bible. How about that? You mean God used a, a guy who quit and Washed out on the missionary journey? Yeah. Sure did. Aren't you glad God uses failures? Aren't you glad God uses people who've messed up? He sure does. Bob Jones Sr. used to say, God only has crooked sticks to use. So if we're crooked stick, that's okay. God will use. That's all we all are. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. What could be accomplished for the Lord if we just believe in some people and befriend them and encourage them? Willing to invest in them and encourage them rather than discourage them? You know, I've, I've, long, I've long been past trying to tell God who He can use and who He can't. You know what I found out? God can use anybody He wants to use. I can look and say, oh, that guy, that guy shouldn't be doing this or that guy shouldn't be doing that. And you know what? He's doing it and God's blessing him. So who am I? You know, Bar do you remember Barnabas's, Barnabas's real name? Joseph or Joseph. You know what that means? It means exalted one. Maybe, maybe that's how he was before he came to know Christ. But once he came to know Christ, they said, no, 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 no. You're not the exalted one anymore. You're the encourager. You're always encouraging somebody. Hmm? Would you like to be Barnabas? Oh, I know, when, when we say... Tell me some great people in the Bible you know of. You know, you'll hear Paul. You'll hear Peter. You'll hear Moses. You'll hear Abraham. You'll hear David, maybe. Not many people say, Barnabas. I want to be like Barnabas. No, not many people say that. But I sure think we could use 
some more Barnabases. Amen? He made a difference in Jerusalem, in the life of Saul, in Antioch, and in the life of John Mark. He was a difference maker. Let's stand together for prayer, shall we? Father, take the truth now this evening. Thank you for everyone's attention tonight, Lord. And as we took some time to kind of walk through the life of Barnabas. Lord, it's, it's, it's been wonderful to, to read what he did. But God, it's been challenging. I sure would like to be like Barnabas. I want to be the encourager that he was. But Lord, for that to happen, we need to be full of the Holy Ghost and of faith. We need to be filled with your Spirit and walk by faith and not by sight. And Lord, I pray you help each one of us this evening to be that way.